In this lesson, we'll start talking about cryptography. First of all, quick disclaimer. No, this will not be a math-based lesson. The exact inner workings of cryptography will leave that for some others. This is also not the applied cryptography class, CSC 381, that we teach. But it does have some overlap with it in the first nah, 10 minutes or so. Our focus is much more going to be on common mistakes and flaws that are made when deploying cryptography to an enterprise environment and with that what that could mean for an attacker who is trying to leverage flaws in the way that the crypto is deployed. So first we have to make sure that we all have the same terminology in place and let's take a look at the basic cryptography process. On the left hand side we see Alice. Alice is the sender of the message um, and the message that Alice writes is called the plain text in terms of cryptography. Alice wants to make sure that Eve does not know what's in the message or maybe even that Eve cannot tamper with the message. She might also want to know that Bob who is the intended recipient knows how to read the contents of the message but also that Bob can have a good sense of confidence that it actually came from Alice and that it hasn't been tampered with. All of that can be achieved by using cryptography. So first of all, let's look at Alice. Alice writes her message called the plain text. And at that point, we're going to transform the plain text. And we're going to make it look completely different into something called the cipher text. That's done by the encryption process. Um, and the encryption process not only takes the plain text as an input, but also a key that's going to influence its behavior. We'll need that same key again at a later stage to recover what the original plain text said. The ciphertext though, once you have it, um, is something that can be freely shared and inspected by an opponent. It's actually the assumption that the opponent has access to the ciphertext and maybe whatever process you use to create it, but not to the key. The ciphertext looks like random stuff, random bits and bytes in a document. And the idea is that if we have a strong um, encryption process, a strong cipher, by looking at the ciphertext itself, we cannot recover anything about the plain text or about the key. And that means that we cannot freely transfer um, the ciphertext over our insecure medium. As long as on the other end of our insecure medium, when we receive that ciphertext, we have a way to recover the plain text from it, and that's called the decryption process. The decryption process takes a key as an input, um, and a key is, has to be either the same key if we're talking about symmetric encryption, or it has to be a mathematically related key if we're talking about asymmetric encryption. But once we have um, the ciphertext, we have the key, and we know what encryption process was used to create that ciphertext, we can recover the plain text again. That means that some of the knowledge about our cryptographic process has to be known to all parties involved, such as um, the uh, ciphertext um, in case of Bob and the key, as well as the decryption process. It also means that if Eve, the opponent here, the evil person, has a way to recover the key, um, the cryptographic efforts are useless because the assumption is that both the ciphertext is publicly known as well as the method that is used to create it. And so protecting the key is our prime directive. I briefly mentioned it already. When we are using the same key to create the ciphertext or to encrypt, um, as we use to decrypt the ciphertext in order to recover the plain text, at that point, we call that symmetric encryption. If the key to encrypt is not the same key, key as we use to decrypt, we call it asymmetric encryption. Why we exactly use symmetric and why we use asymmetric encryption is something we'll explore a lot more in CSE 381, Applied Cryptography. For now, all we have to realize is that symmetric encryption is fast, much faster than asymmetric encryption and that there really is no size um, limit on the message that we're trying to convey. 
asymmetric encryption is slow um, and there is a limit on the message size, but it can provide more protections than symmetric encryption can. Ideally, we'd like to use all four. We'd like to ensure message confidentiality, which means that if the uh, ciphertext is intercepted, nothing can be deduced about the plain text. We want to ensure message integrity, which means that if someone tampers with the message, we know that it has been tampered with. We want authentication, which means that we can figure out who sent the message. And we want non-repudiation, which means that the sender cannot deny sending the message. Symmetric encryption can only provide confidentiality. Asymmetric encryption can provide all four of these services, but it does come at the price of being slower and limited in message size. Later on, we'll take a look at how we solve that issue. If we're looking at attacks against cryptography, we can broadly divide those up in three main categories. On the one uh, left-hand side here on the slide, we see classical crypt analysis, which uh, consists of mathematical attacks against the algorithms or just by trying all possible keys to see if uh, we recover the message. That is much harder than it sounds and um, it should be infeasible in a reasonable amount of time to do that, um, but they are attacks. More commonly than that though, we see attacks that uh, leverage implementation flaws. Um, in other words, we may have a secure cipher, but if that is not also implemented securely, both in terms of software as in the way that we're using it, we still have vulnerabilities. The mathematical cipher might be good, but we made a mistake when we were trying to translate it into a usable computer system. And lastly, we have people and people are always vulnerable. So that means that social engineering could be used to recover the key of the material. So the classical cryptanalysis, which attack the mathematical algorithm or the key, the implementation attacks, which um, attack the implementation of the software, of the ciphers in software, and then social engineering leveraging the fact that in the end we need people um, in the equation somewhere as well. Up till now we've mostly been talking about symmetric encryption, in which the encryption key and the decryption key are the same. As mentioned earlier, um, that's not always the case. When we're um, separating out the encryption key and the decryption key into two separate parts um, that are related but they're definitely not the same, then we have a system called asymmetric encryption. And at that point we see that the encryption key and the decryption key are separate and more specifically what we figured out is that the encryption key, so the message that I use to encrypt a message, can be public. Anyone is allowed to know it. And you do not have to keep that one secret. On the other hand, the key to decrypt, that has to be secret and we call that the private key. And that leads to interesting situations because now I can publish all of those public key in a say telephone book or in another sort of directory. And if I want to send a message to someone, I can look up their public key and encrypt the message. And at that point, only the person who has the corresponding private key can decrypt it. And since the private key has to remain secret, it means that only the intended recipient of the message is able to decrypt it. So in the example here on this slide, Bob um, wants to send a message to Alice. So maybe it's a reply to something Alice sent earlier. So Bob takes his X, his plain text, and he encrypts it using Alice's public key. How he found it? doesn't really matter. He maybe looked it up, maybe Alice told him in the past, but either way, it is freely shareable. Once Bob applies the encryption algorithm and the key to his plain text, he yields the ciphertext which can be sent. The ciphertext can then be input into the decryption algorithm using the private key, and that yields the um, original plain text again. Important here is that the public key can be shared, but the private key has to remain absolutely secret and only known to one entity. In asymmetric encryption, sorry, in symmetric encryption, both parties of the conversation knew about the key. 
Now only the recipient knows about the private part of the key. The keys are linked to each other and they are using all kinds of different math approaches, but it's not a freely chosen set of two keys. Typically, one half of the key pair is freely chosen and then the other one is computed. Of course, um, there's a lot of math that goes into that um, and that's the stuff that we will explore in other classes. But in this particular case, let's just assume that we have a key pair consisting of a public and a private part and that they are related. And what that means is that any message encrypted with one key in the key pair can only be decrypted by the other key. In this particular case, which one you choose as the encryption key and which one you choose as the decryption key is not necessarily as important, as long as one of them stays absolutely secret and the other one um, may be publicly known. But if we're not just interested in secrecy of the message, we can actually go a little further. We can switch it around. Because what we said was, any message encrypted with one of the two keys in the key pair can only be decrypted with the other key in that key pair. Let's think that through. Now let's say that Alice is going to send a message to Bob but this time, instead of using Bob's public key, Alice is going to encrypt it with her private key. She is the only one who knows that private key. But her public key can be freely shared, and that means that anyone who receives the message can decrypt it. Now, that at first glance is a little strange, but we're not trying to protect the confidentiality of the message here. We're trying to protect the integrity. And that means that if the message decrypts with that public key, it must have been encrypted with the corresponding private key. And we know that only Alice knows the private key. It is not shared with anyone else. And so if we switch that around and encrypt with the private key of the sender so that the public key of the sender can be used to decrypt it, at that point we are not protecting message confidentiality, we are protecting message integrity. This is the basic principles um, under which digital signatures work. There's a little bit um, more steps involved in a true digital signature, but the basic concept is this. Related to the typical encryption and decryption steps is something called message, message digests or a hash function. And basically what it does is that if you apply a hash function to an input to a message, it creates a fingerprint of that message. And that means that you can treat it as unique for that message. Each message has one fingerprint and each fingerprint typically only applies to one message. Now that's not the case, we can prove that there will always be more than one message that has the same um, fingerprint. But uh, And at that point we say that there's a collision, that the messages collide. That's not necessarily a problem. Um, what we need to also realize is that it is so unlikely, so incredibly difficult to find those matches that we can assume that they don't exist. Now, if we want to use message digesting or hashing securely, we have to have a couple of assumptions in place. First off, we have to assume that the hashing algorithm is a one-way function, and that means that once we apply the function and we get our digest out of it, we will not be able to go back to the original message. And that makes sense if we realize that every input um, can lead to a hash, but each hash must necessarily match with multiple inputs. Even if I have the hash, I don't know which of the inputs was chosen. So what we want is a one-way function. I can compute the hash, but I can't um, compute the original text from the hash. Secondly, it is a deterministic uh, process, which means that if I apply a um, hash function to a message, I will always get the same message digest in return. There is no key that influences this. It's just a function, no key. 
and the function is, like I said, deterministic, which means that the same message will always yield the same hash. Hashing algorithms also are able to take variable length input. It doesn't typically matter whether you put one byte in it or whether you put one terabyte worth of data in it. It will always work, and that's not always the case with symmetric or with asymmetric encryption. The output length, that is determined by the algorithm that you're using, but typically it is much shorter than the typical message would be. As mentioned before, these secure hash algorithms are to be resistant to collisions, which means it should be very difficult for me to find two messages that match the same hash. That's called um, collision resistance. And lastly, what we want to make sure, as we do with all cryptography, even if we make a very small change in the input, that should lead to a very large change in the output. And by looking at the output, it should not be clear what changed in the input. For example, we have the SHA-256 hash algorithm, and um, SHA means secure hash algorithm. And it doesn't matter whether we apply it to a one byte file or to a hundred gigabyte file, the message digest will also be exactly 256 bits long. Message digest algorithms or hash functions tend to fall out of grace as soon as there are even signs that collisions are starting to become feasible. So when it comes to implementing hashes, it's always good to know what's going on right now as you implement it, but you also have to be able to pivot and, and, and alter what hash you're using if for whatever reason, cryptanalysis reveals that um, collisions are possible. When we put all of this together into a network protocol description called TLS, um, we start getting now what encryption basically the internet relies on now tls or transport layer security combines a number of cryptographic techniques into one cryptographic protocol so tls itself is not a cipher it's not an encryption algorithm it is a protocol it is a way in which we can combine different ciphers and the reason that we want to do that is because we want to make sure that the strengths and weaknesses associated with each cipher or cipher type are canceled out by the others. For example, we said that asymmetric encryption is slow and limited in message, but it can use to authenticate the sender. So that's what we're using it for in TLS. We also said that symmetric encryption is used for message exchange and, and that it is fast, but it, it lacks certain protections. That's why we use symmetric encryptions for message transfer, but we're using a key we're only going to use once, for example. The TLS protocol is something we'll discuss in a lot more detail in CSC 381, Applied Cryptography. But for now, let's keep in mind that it is a protocol that combines different ciphers um, and that if we decide to stop using one cipher, um, we can always plug a different one in its place. The beauty of TLS is that it can be applied to just about any other network protocol. For example, we can take HTTP, the um, web protocol, and we can just wrap it in TLS, um, make sure that it is secure. And now it's known as HTTPS. For older version of HTTP, uh, HTTP 1.0 and 1.1, that's an option. In HTTP 2.0, it is the default that TLS is applied. We can do the same thing with IMAP. Uh, IMAP is the internet message um, access protocol. So basically how do we access emails stored in a remote mailbox and keep them there for manipulation? But if we add TLS to that, it's called IMAP-S. And so just about any existing protocol can be made more secure by applying TLS to it. For TLS to be effective though, we need to have um, at least one of the parties present a valid certificate. And a certificate is an attestation of identity verified by a trusted third party. Um, ideally, both parties in the conversation have one, but under most practical circumstances, we'll typically see that only the server authenticates to the client, that the client typically does not authenticate using the same mechanism. In order for TLS to work, the server, um, or at least one of the parties, must have a certificate. They must also have the private key that matches the certificate. When those two are in place, we can use the encryption algorithm. But it also means that if I'm an attacker and I'm able to compromise the private key, then I can act as if I were uh, one of the other parties.
some related concepts um, to TLS, uh, to encryption, I should say, symmetric and asymmetric encryption. First one is XOR obfuscation or ZOR obfuscation. Sometimes we're not necessarily looking for secrecy. Um, sometimes light is good enough. For example, if I am a malware author and I don't feel like um, implementing full encryption to bypass an intrusion detection system, I might go for a simple solution. Um, and that's called obfuscation. XOR is a very common method by which we do that. And basically what we do is that each byte of the plain text or the cipher text, depending on where we're going, um, is um, XORed with a constant value, uh, also a corresponding byte. Um, XOR is one of those operations that's symmetric. So if I apply an XOR of 13 to, or 30, hex 30, for example, here to the uppercase H and I get a lowercase X back, if I apply that same um, hex 30 to the lowercase x, I will get the uppercase h back again. This is the principle of stream ciphers, but we can also use that standalone. XOR obfuscation, fairly simple um, to implement. Uh, most programming languages have built-in support for it, and if not, it's pretty easy to do that on your own. We'll do that in CSC 381. Base64 encoding we have seen in the past. Um, Older protocols, for example, um, email um, or HTTP even, um, were not able to include binary data. So they had to encode the binary data as plain ASCII. Base64 was one of those um, mecha mechanisms by which we did that. Did that. So what we do, can do with that is basically any binary value, um, sorry, any, vi any value period can be represented as a 7-bit ASCII value. So there's, there's some magic that happens with that under the ground. Um, your string typically becomes larger because we, your um, 8 bits um, per character typically have to be mapped to 7 bits, so that adds a little bit of space. But here on the bottom, we'll see that Hello World, for example, encodes as this odd-looking string. The good thing is that it's um, easily recognizable, almost in all situations when you see something like this, and especially when it ends with two um, equals signs, you can almost for certain make the assumption that you're looking at something base64 encoded. And then lastly, keep in mind that base64 encoding and hashing are two different things. And um, base64 encoding is something I can undo. Um, it's um, um, not a one-way function. A hash always produces a fixed length digest. Base64 encoded messages grow as the plain text grows. Hashes do typically have an upper limit on how much data they can uh, process, although in most cases those upper limits are not of uh, practical concern. Base64 does not have that limit. And hashes have collisions, which means that multiple messages will calculate to the same hash, but Base64 encoded strings do not. Um, they only represent one plain text. <laughs>